One of the claims often made to support the resurrection of Jesus is that his disciples died for their belief. Now, some observe that we see many examples of people dying for false beliefs, say those who brought down the Twin Towers. And the Christian quickly replies, But the Christians who died said they were eyewitnesses of Jesus. It's not just what they believed, they were in a position to know the truth. They wouldn't die for something they know is a lie. This is a dance that happens more frequently and more predictably than the chicken dance, the macarena, and the floss combined. Or whatever dances are popular at weddings near you. But here's the thing. The real question that former me didn't ask, and not enough people do ask, is how do we know that anyone who claimed to see a resurrected Jesus died defending the truth? What evidence exists? Why does anyone accept this notion as a fact? Last month, I put out this challenge on Twitter. I'd like to debate the topic, eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection could have recanted to save their life, but didn't. While no one has taken me up on this, I was delighted to see apologist Mike Winger tweet, I'll be live tonight on the historical evidence that the apostles were martyred slash persecuted for their claims about Jesus' resurrection. I've debated Mike before on the topic of resurrection, and I know he likes to do his homework. So let's see how well he did. To be clear up front, here are the basic criteria that I would need to say that anyone qualifies for the description of eyewitness defending martyrdom. That the person in question, 1. Said they saw a resurrected Jesus. 2. They had a chance to save their lives by recanting. And 3. Rather than recant, they chose to die. That seems like the bare minimum someone would need to establish, and a very reasonable standard. And should be easy to meet given the veracity with which Christians boldly claim this dogmatic truth. Welcome to the Tuesday live stream. I am uh, joined today by my obstinate cat. While Mike's cat <laughs> is adorable, for the sake of time, I'm going to be addressing only the parts of Mike's videos that are directly relevant, leaving out cat interruptions, live stream chat banter, technical difficulties, and sidetrack topics. The link to Mike's original video is in the description. Please let me know in the comments if you think I failed to include anything germane to the question at hand. So we're asking, uh, were the apostles really willing to die on the conviction that they had really seen Jesus bodily alive after his death? That's the question. Excellent. That's exactly what I'm here for. I've got my notepad ready to go. Let's do this. A lot of the content I'm getting today is coming from The Fate of the Apostles, a wildly expensive book written by Sean McDowell. I always encourage people to look at primary sources. So we're going to follow along in Sean McDowell's book and see how Mike does. So we're going to talk about um, specific apostles. We'll talk um, about Peter. We'll talk a little bit about Paul. And we'll talk about James, the brother of Jesus. Just those three? What about all the other alleged eyewitnesses? The woman at the tomb, the sons of Zebedee, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Simon the Zealot? Is that just too much information for one video? Or is it because those people all disappeared from reliable history so they couldn't help your case? Let me first establish this, that in the early church there was general persecution. That's the first thing I want to establish. General persecution? I thought the point of this was to talk specifically about individuals who were eyewitnesses. Anyone who wasn't an eyewitness merely falls into the category of someone who could unknowingly be persecuted or killed for an idea that they think to be true, but is actually a lie. And when you signed up to be a Christian, you were signing up knowing full well it would cost you potentially your life, your friends, your family, that this was just normal status quo for first century. While it is unfortunate that some awful deeds were done against some Christians in the first few centuries, the idea that there was widespread, systematic, institutional persecution of Christians is more fantasy than reality. Something I hope to go into in more detail in a future video. It wasn't until the third century that Christianity was declared illegal in the Roman Empire, and that lasted only a decade. But there was one particularly unfortunate first century incident. And he writes the following about uh, early early Christians during the sort of second, second generation Christianity uh, in 109 AD. Not the first generation the eyewitnesses I'm hoping to hear about. Um, Emperor Nero, it seems, historically had, had lit the, the, the Caesar of Rome. He, he had lit on fire a section of Rome so that he could destroy that and then build what he wanted there. Well, the rumor was going around that it was Nero who did it, and he wanted to get rid of that rumor. He didn't want to be blamed for the fire. So here's what happened. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. Okay, so Emperor Nero was caught setting fires, and rather than take the blame himself, he instead framed and blamed a minority group, the Christians. You can be forgiven if your mind draws parallels between that and current political distraction tactics. But for now, we're going to skip the gory details for these killings. There arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. Exactly. These Christians weren't killed because of what they believed, the topic we're supposed to be here to discuss. They were a group of generally peaceful people being villainized by a corrupt leader as a distraction. 
terrible event, but irrelevant to the question at hand. In the very Gospels, Jesus himself talks about how general persecution is going to happen in the church. This is like an expected thing. Questions about the reliability of the Gospels aside, for the time being, I could even grant that the Bible passages that Mike takes a huge chunk of the video to present with vague generalizations about upcoming hardships are actual predictions rather than after-the-fact storytelling I suspect they are, and we're still not remotely on topic to specific deaths of specific eyewitnesses. All religions predict hard times for their followers. It's a trope. To say, Mike, everything you said doesn't count because you're saying, for the Bible tells me so. For the Bible tells me so? You mean like this? I don't just want to say that the early church in general suffered persecution, but that, that the eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection were sincere about their claims. And the way they proved their sincerity is they were willing to suffer and die for those claims. Finally. Let's go. I don't need every single person who says they saw Jesus to die a martyr's death. Fun fact. Even if we take the Bible to be completely historically accurate, the tally of every single person who says they saw a resurrected Jesus is exactly one person. Paul. One guy, that's it. No one else personally makes a claim to have seen him. One guy. I'm sure this will come up again. But I, I really would like for my central witnesses, Peter, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul the Apostle, I like these guys to have like really good you know, reasoning and support for the idea that they weren't lying about things. And that's what we're here for. Let's go. What do you got? Let's, let's start with Peter. In John 21, verse 18, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This, he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. The author of John is saying, this is very clear, he's saying, hey, this, this statement from Jesus was about how Peter would die. Okay, so he's going he's gonna to be killed. He's going to be led to some death that involves a stretching out of his hands. I agree that the author of the fourth gospel wanted his readers to relate this statement to Peter's death. He's pretty clear in verse 19, but it's not clear that this death would have to do with stretching his hands. Verse 18 is talking about putting on clothes. When Peter is old, he'll need to stretch out his hands so that another person can put clothes on him. Maybe it's the carrying him where he doesn't want to go is the death part. Maybe Peter is set out to sea on an iceberg. Frankly, being old and dressed by someone else and being led around where you don't want to go sounds much more like a nursing home than a crucifixion. Christians may like to affirm it, but the stretch death is a bit of a stretch. Mike's main source, McDowell's book, provides a handy list of biblical scholars who agree with me on this point. There's debate on whether this was crucifixion or that he was uh, burned, you know, maybe he was strapped to a pole and burned in a fire. There's debate over that. I don't know. It doesn't actually matter. It doesn't matter? We're here to examine something as subtle as motivations and death day decisions from 2,000 years ago. And yet for Mike's best example, there isn't even clarity on method of death. Isn't it more likely that the sources would get method of death correct ahead of accurately depicting the victim's mental state? How does this not matter? Because the question is, was he willing to die for the things he said were true? That's the question. Yes, please. That's the question. If you take it from a Christian perspective, you're saying, hey, Jesus was predicting that Peter would die a martyr's death. I'm sorry. Where in these verses does it say that Peter would die a martyr? It couldn't be more vague. Verse 19 says, by what kind of death he was to glorify God. The verses right before this are Jesus repeatedly asking Peter to feed his sheep, tend his followers. It's possible this author meant martyrdom. But if he did, he doesn't say it. You have to interpret a certain way to get there. Either position you take gives you Peter's martyrdom for his uh, belief in Christ. I hate to be picky, but where in this passage does it say that Peter would die for his belief in Christ? It predicts he will die as an old man being carried somewhere. So John 13, uh, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving. Um, and he's talking about his death very clearly in the text. Peter says, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Um, again, evidence for the martyrdom of Peter. Jesus is going to die soon. And Peter is going to die later. It says nothing at all about how or why Peter will die. Second Peter 1.12. Since I know that put the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So he's like, I'm going to die. Assuming we take this passage at face value, we have Peter as an old man talking about how he will die soon and wants to leave a legacy. This is how old people talk. They creep people out by accepting their own mortality and the fact that they have fewer days ahead of them than behind them. There is nothing here that even hints of martyrdom. Nothing that he'll die because he saw Jesus resurrected. It's much worse because there's not even a single phrase in either 1st or 2nd Peter about the author having seen a resurrected Jesus. Even if we take these books to be completely historically accurate, Peter doesn't pass the first test. He never claims to have seen the resurrected Jesus. 
non-Peter people claim that Peter claimed to have seen resurrected Jesus, but Peter himself never says he was an eyewitness. Here's how the skeptic would respond. If, if you're in the live chat and you're there, you know it. They would say that Second Peter is not written by Peter, that it was forged. Thank you, Bart Ehrman, for, for, doing, for doing that to everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't just Bart Ehrman, but um, he's helped popularize the idea that, that this book was just forged. Of all the books in the New Testament, Second Peter is one of the least affirmed by scholars in the field. Accepted as authentic by almost no one whose terms of employment allow academic freedom to have such an opinion, even Mike's source book agrees. The majority of scholars consider Second Peter to be pseudepigraphical. That's a fancy plate academic word for forgery. Mike should know that doubts about the authenticity of Second Peter goes all the way back to the earliest church fathers who address such issues. Men that Mike quotes all the time, like Origen and Eusebius in the 3rd century, were dubious about Second Peter's authenticity even back then. Doubting the authorship of Second Peter has been happening for millennia. I'll be doing videos on New Testament authorship in the future to lay out this case in more detail, but I just wanted to counter Mike's lone gunman insinuations for a minute. But for the sake of today's discussion, I could grant the veracity of 1st and 2nd Peter because the authors of these books don't claim to be witnesses of resurrected Jesus, don't specify the circumstances of Peter's death, how could they if they were genuine, nor do they indicate that the author ever had an opportunity to recant to save his life. Now I'm going to give you some extra biblical sources. Here's 1st Clement. This was written around 95, 97 AD. So this is a first century document. He says, let us take the noble examples of our own generation. Through jealousy and envy, the greatest and most just pillars of the church were persecuted and came even unto death. I'm less interested in the death part and more interested in the why they died part. This source is saying they died because of envy and jealousy. If they allegedly died because they wouldn't recant seeing Jesus alive, why does Clement instead blame envy and jealousy? Peter, through unjust envy, endured not one or two, but many labors, and at last, having delivered his testimony, departed unto the place of glory due to him. To the author of Clement, Peter was killed from a motive of unjust envy. I'm not seeing anything affirming the unwavering resurrected Jesus motive here. He's not building a case for the martyrdom of these guys. He's drawing from common memory. Everybody already, everybody knows about this as far as Clement's concerned. Everybody knows Peter and Paul both suffered and died for the things that they believe to be true. The fact that Clement doesn't actually say Peter died for what he believed to be true is somehow evidence that everyone must have already known that Peter died for what he believed to be true. This is exactly the kind of thinking that drives me crazy on this issue. Christians are so busy filling in the blanks with traditions and stories and beliefs that they don't care that the sources don't actually say what's being claimed. And so he taps into that to make his case. Taps into that? Seems that Mike affirms the consensus view that Clement was not a witness to Peter's death, but was rather accepting as fact the stories about Peter that were circulating in the early Christian community. This passage tells us more about what was commonly believed than what actually happened. This is another example of why I'm passionate about this issue. Christians accept as unquestioned fact events that have less evidence than legends. Okay, here's another one. This is from Ignatius. Ignatius writing in his letter to the Smyrnians, um, for myself, I am convinced and believe that even after the resurrection, he was in the flesh, speaking of Jesus. Indeed, when he came to Peter and his friends, he said to them, take hold of me, touch me and see that I am not a bodiless ghost. And they at once touched him and were convinced, clutching his body and his very breath. For this reason, they despised death itself and proved its victors. This is basically Ignatius affirming that he believes the biblical account. Not surprising. This is this is his language for saying it's like the exalting of martyrdom. He's like, look, they were killed, and he's he's using euphemistic terms to exalt the fact that they were willing to die for their faith, and for their faith, not just faith in general. Specifically, according to Ignatius, these were willing to die, Peter and his friends, because they believed Jesus had bodily risen. But the letter to the Smyrnians is estimated to have been written around 107 AD over 70 years after Jesus' death and over 40 years after Peter's. At this point, Ignatius isn't telling us what he has first-hand knowledge of. As a church father, he's repeating the legends that have already sprung up by this time. Another source, the Apocalypse of Peter. Um, uh, then there's the Ascension of Isaiah. I'm not going to go over all these. Uh, the Acts of Peter, the Apocryphon of James, the Dionysius of Corinth, um, Tertullian, and the Moratorium uh, Canon. These are all different sources that mention one way or another the martyrdom of Peter. Are you kidding me? Apocalypse of Peter? Acts of Peter? These are books that were completely rejected by early church fathers. Even by Bible standards, these works say a lot of weird stuff. Talking dogs, resurrected fish, and Peter repeatedly paralyzing his own daughter to keep her from seducing men. 
these are the places we should look for trustworthy accounts of a man's mental state? Maybe they're even embellishing or saying weird stuff, but they're drawing from a historical core, right? They're elaborating on something that actually happened. Why does that follow? Just like the widely varied King Arthur legends centuries later, the various incarnations of the Peter death stories need only be built upon most commonly circulated tales in order to have rung true to the Christian faith or to have inspired new iterations. So that's Mike's case for Peter. Did we establish that Peter claimed to be an eyewitness of resurrected Jesus? As ludicrous as this may sound, we did not. Even if we consider the two books of the Bible that bear his name to be authentic, which we almost certainly should not, they make no such claim. In no record does Peter himself say he saw a resurrected Jesus. Did we establish that Peter could have saved his life by recanting? We did not. If we accept tradition at face value, Peter died during the persecution of Christians by Nero, and Mike already established that Nero's war on the Christians was about scapegoats to cover fires he sets. Mike already established that Nero's war on Christians was about scapegoats to cover the fires he set. If he caught Peter, the leader of the Christians, it is doubtful that any words of denial by Peter would have stopped Nero's self-preservation motivated execution order. Did we establish that Peter chose to die rather than recant? The details of his death are not recorded in any document considered reliable by any Christian scholar, but rather in fanciful works. Even so, such an event is still not described. Paul went under constant persecution. We can actually look at a list of some of the things he went through. For the sake of time, I'm willing to grant that Paul was persecuted during his life, since we're interested in the dying parts anyhow. The undisputed Pauline letters establish this well enough for me. Oh, Mike's just saying for the Bible tells him so. Like this? That is terribly ignorant. I'm not trying to be rude to you, but you're, you're being really silly. Okay, this is like, you can't approach history with like a SpongeBob mentality. What is it with Christians and SpongeBob? You have to imagine all of it happened. Like SpongeBob, our buddy here, love this thing. <laughs> Boy, are we getting the comments on SpongeBob, wow. It makes him think that the character represents appeals to fallacies. Did I miss something? Why is SpongeBob the go-to cartoon on this? You've got to think about this stuff and like look at the actual evidence. I don't know who else you're seeing or talking to that's levying these For the Bible Tells Me So claims against you. Though, if you're a content creator and want to use that animation jingle for yourself, there's a link to a free-to-use green screen version in the description. Go for it. But if it's me, I'm not dismissing something in the Bible out of hand. I absolutely look at the evidence. I just granted you Paul's persecution because I've evaluated the evidence for some of the letters attributed to Paul and consider them to be authentic, legitimate sources. Other letters I do not. I absolutely do spend a significant time thinking about this stuff and evaluating evidence. On the other hand, is the reverse true for Mike? Does he evaluate the Bible phrase by phrase based on evidence? Or does he merely accept all of it at face value because it's in the Bible? You just saw Mike saying he'll defend the authorship of 2 Peter, even when the majority of people who do this for a living, including his source book for this video, think it's the least reliable part of the Bible. Mike, could you please point me to the verses in the New Testament that you think are inaccurate or didn't happen? If you can't, then you're giving every appearance that For the Bible Tells Me So trumps any evidential investigation. When you see me use it, it's in a context where the Bible is the single source for a claim. Like Roman guards at Jesus' tomb, for example. We learn of them only in the book of Matthew. So it's fully appropriate to label it For the Bible Tells Me So. It's a comment on sources, not veracity. I'm trying to build a case for why you should trust that when Peter, James, and Paul said they saw Jesus, they were sincere. Well, only Paul said he saw Jesus. We don't have any such testimony from Peter or James. I do agree that Paul was sincere. Now, according to Sean McDowell, he has eight sources within the first and second century that all refer to uh, the idea that Paul was killed for his proclamation of Christ. McDowell acknowledges that we have no passages in the Bible to tell us about the circumstances of Paul's death. He tells us that while tradition has Paul beheaded in Rome during Nero's reign, McDowell admits scholars disagree significantly over the validity of this tradition. I mean, one of these sources, the Acts of Paul, includes a detail that milk sprayed from Paul's neck when he was beheaded. For each source, McDowell has to apologize for legendary development, conflicts with other stories, or conflicts with facts. And this is somehow the end of Mike's case for Paul. So let's sum up against my criteria. Did Paul say he saw a resurrected Jesus? Yes. In fact, he's the only one. But it's yes with an asterisk, so I'm going to come back to it. Did Paul have a chance to save his life by recanting? No, we don't have evidence that he did. Moreover, if we accept the tradition that Paul was killed around 65 AD under Nero, then it would have been a political execution, not a theological one. Paul had no value to Nero as a deconvert, only as a dead insurrection leader. Did Paul refuse to recant? 
is established to my satisfaction that Paul underwent earlier beatings and imprisonment, but as we have no record of an opportunity to recant to save his life, we certainly don't have a record that he refused to recant. Even though the Apostle Paul doesn't pass the test, he hits the high score with one out of three. Now, why did I put an asterisk beside his claim that he saw the resurrected Jesus? He says it in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8, And last of all, he also appeared to me. And I accept that 1 Corinthians is one of the letters actually written by Paul. However, I contend that Paul saw a vision in his head of Jesus, not the actual resurrected body of Jesus. This could be the subject of a whole video. But briefly, if we take the Acts versions of Paul's Damascus Road experience at face value, in chapter 9, the light made Paul immediately fall to the ground blind, and he merely hears a voice. It specifically says his companion saw no one. In chapter 22, which retells the story, Paul's companion saw light, not a body, but light, and heard no voice. If Jesus' physical body was there, why didn't the companions see or hear him? And why would Jesus leave heaven to enter a physical body again when he knew Paul would go blind immediately and not even see him? In Galatians 1.12, when Paul describes how he comes to understand the gospel, he denies it came from a human, but rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Strange wording if it was a physical encounter with the man Jesus. Most damningly, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul twice outright admits that he can't say for sure that he had a physical experience. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. It makes sense that Paul was so sincere, because he had a very sincere experience. It just wasn't with an actual resurrected body of Jesus. The experience may well have been divine, or not, but what Paul saw was a vision in his head. Polycarp, writing in 110 AD, he mentions the sufferings of Paul and, quote, the rest of the apostles. One little bit of bait and switch that I find in these conversations is to play with the definitions of the word disciples and apostles. In some contexts, these words refer specifically to the 12 who served with Jesus. Other times, the words mean more of a larger sphere of people and church leaders. For example, neither Paul nor James, whom Mike is defending today, were part of the 12, but are actually called apostles. Still other contexts allow every believer to this day to be called a disciple or an apostle. At the beginning, Mike was pointing to general suffering of apostles in the broad sense, but his argument claims that martyrs were eyewitnesses. It's important to keep an eye on context shift. This is why I'm careful to specify the 12 if I mean the 12 and eyewitnesses of resurrected Jesus, if I mean those alleged people. There's a couple sources, early sources, early second century, that mentioned that all the apostles suffered. Who do these sources mean when they say apostles? The 12? A larger group? Every believer? All of them. They all suffered. They all were persecuted. And that's consistent with all the rest of the data we have. If we're talking about the 12, then it's not consistent with the data. Our sources for the lives of most of the 12 after Jesus died are nearly non-existent and highly suspect and contradictory when they exist at all. And even so, some of these disciple legends include the men dying peacefully of old age. Who was the church leader in Jerusalem? G James, the brother of Jesus, Acts 15. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, it mentions James. James as a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. It says um, that he was, Jesus was, you know, crucified, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. The problem with advocating so heavily that this portion of 1 Corinthians 15 is an early creed that Paul is reciting is that it means Paul is reciting it as hearsay rather than writing it as his own personal knowledge. I believe that this entire passage is legend. That the appearance to the Twelve, the Five Hundred, the Apostles, all of that are merely the stories that arose among the early believers. I will note here that in Galatians 1.18, a book I accept as genuine, Paul says he met James three years after his conversion, and it's reasonable to think that the topic of Jesus would have come up, but there's no record for what was said. We're still lacking a first-hand affirmation from James. This creed is second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand, fifth-hand, sixth-hand, being recited, not eyewitness testimony. And then they stayed as witnesses, traveling around guaranteeing the witness, saying, look, it's true, see, it's true, we're eyewitnesses. And they died for that proclamation, proving that they meant it, they were genuine. That's what we're examining today. But the video is 40 minutes in, and so far the evidence isn't particularly strong. What do we have for James? Well, we have uh, Hegesippus, uh, which is an interesting... This is you're going to enjoy this, I think, if you're still with me, if you haven't fallen asleep yet. Um, Hegesippus is a guy who, um, or, you know, he wrote stuff that's clearly legendary. It seems clear, right? That what I'm about to read to you, I'll, I'll see if I can put it on your screen. This is like legendary extra stuff, okay? Um, but you can't just ignore it. We don't necessarily ignore it, 
but what we do is apportion our confidence. If the author felt free to exaggerate such that you can't get through reading it without giggling, then what level of confidence should we put on the details? Just because they are less fanciful doesn't mean that the author had any more reason to be truthful. If someone tells you that they rode a pink unicorn to McDonald's, do you automatically believe that they went to McDonald's? You wouldn't rule it out, but that claim is now tainted. Uh, Hegesippus, it seems, um, yep, yeah elaborated <laughs> what can i say do thou tell us what is the door of jesus the crucified and he answered with a loud voice why ask ye me concerning jesus the son of man he himself sitteth in heaven at the right hand of the great power and shall come on the clouds of heaven so even if we take this at face value james doesn't say he saw a risen jesus just to be clear and so he's kind of quoting jesus here or and stay with me here the elaboration prone author decided to put the words of Jesus from the gospel into his brother's mouth. And here's what they did to James. And they threw down the just man and said to one another, let us stone James the just. Like I doubt when they're stoning him, they're calling him James the just. So they let stone James the just and they began to stone him for he was not killed by the fall. Threw him off a building and then stoned him? I mean, maybe, but this feels like someone trying to retcon two conflicting legends into one harmonious story. Like the time DC Comics briefly decided there should be three Jokers to account for different Joker backstory legends. A lot of people are going to say, oh, this has signs of legendary development. We have to crumple it up and throw it into the garbage can. But you see, it doesn't have signs of total fabrication, like James was a real guy. Using existing locations and famous people as characters in a story doesn't mean there's a historical core. Only that someone wants to set their story in a historical context. Did you know that Spider-Man met Barack Obama? And that Spider-Man lives in New York City? I'm constantly confused as to why the use of verifiable city names in the Bible is supposed to be compelling evidence that the supernatural parts are true. See, because that's not even close to our only source about James. Josephus. Then why did you start with the least credible guy? He's a first century writer, and he tells him an event that happened when the new high priest in Jerusalem saw an opportunity in, with the absence of the Roman pro procurator, or governor, the Roman governor was gone. And so now he had a chance to take out someone he hated. And the one he hated was a guy named James, the brother of Jesus. Here's how he's introduced, right? Josephus, he, he introduces James, not first as James, but James as the brother of Jesus who was called Christ. Um, so when he formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Okay, so you've established that a particular high priest had a beef with James, and when he had a chance, had him brought in and stoned. That doesn't sound like already hated James would have been given an opportunity to recant, nor would it have made any difference if he did. So we have other evidence for James as well. The first apocalypse of James, uh, the second apocalypse of James, pseudo-Clementines, um, uh, recognitions, um, we have that. Um, and those are all about 200 AD, those sources. And they seem to confirm various streams of thought agreeing that James was martyred for his teaching about Jesus. None of these books listed are accepted as authentic by scholars. McDowell cites them merely to affirm what the common beliefs about James might have been hundreds of years after the fact. Mike pushes this claim further, but all of these sources disagree on the specifics. And none of them tells us about James being given the opportunity to recant. And that's Mike's whole case for James. Let's see how it matches up with my criteria. Did James claim to have seen risen Jesus? No. Even if we take the book of James as entirely genuine, he makes no such claim about himself. Was James given a chance to recant to save his life? If so, we have no record of it, and it seems unlikely. Did James choose to die rather than recant? We have no record that he was given a chance, so no record that he made such a choice. James scores 0 for 3, and yet he's in the top 3 that Mike feels most strongly make his case. I think what you're getting is this. There's lots of sources that promote specifically Paul, James, Peter, their martyrdom. No, what we have, if we accept all of this at face value, are the deaths of three men who had powerful enemies. Two had political enemies, and one a personal enemy. In other words, they meant it. That's all we're saying. No, you're trying to say much more than that. You're trying to say that we can be confident that these men were eyewitnesses of risen Jesus because they wouldn't have knowingly died for a lie. But to say that they died for a lie means they could have saved their lives by recanting. And among these three, we've yet to see evidence that they were given a chance to recant, let alone that they refused to do so. Now, what about sources that say they recanted? There isn't a single one. There isn't one source from history that suggests that any of the witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, let alone Peter, James, or Paul, that any of them recanted. As I've demonstrated, we have no reason to believe that any of these men were given a chance to recant. It seems Peter, Paul, and James were all victim of political enemies. Nero, in particular, didn't care at all what Peter and Paul claimed or believed. They were useful public enemies for an agenda. Show me where an eyewitness martyr had a chance to recant, and then this claim will mean something. Otherwise, it's all just speculation from silence. And you said any witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. I really hope you'll do a follow-up with evidence for anyone else besides these three men. 
As far as my research leads me, including the McDowell book that Mike uses, the remaining of the 12 disappeared entirely from reliable history upon Jesus' death. So my conclusion is this. Peter, Paul, and James were sincere. That's it. This is like all I'm trying to establish. They meant it when they said they saw Jesus alive. Those were genuine claims. First, you'd have to establish that Peter and James actually made the claim that they saw Jesus alive. Call me pedantic or picky or what have you, but where is the actual first-hand evidence that they made these claims? I lived for decades just going along with the narrative that this was true. But when I went looking for myself to affirm it, I came up empty-handed. Please try it for yourself. Then you'd have to show that they were killed for their claim of seeing Jesus alive and that they could have saved their lives by changing their story. Again, if you're a Christian, you probably think I'm frustratingly literal and pedantic about this. But Mike and the other Christians are making extremely specific claims that are backed only with sources even Mike has to laugh at that make vague allusions at best. Nothing presented today says what Mike wants it to say. Peter really believed it. Paul really believed it. James really believed it. And they're all three very important in our case for the resurrection of Jesus. Does that mean that they saw Jesus alive? Well, I think that we will then go to um, the number of appearances. Oh, cool. You gave me a chance to use for the Bible tells me so. The only source for said appearances is the Bible. And if you find the Bible's supernatural claims to be compelling, then you already believe the Bible's claims about the resurrection. You're giving it a facade of historical evaluation. But between us, I'm the one who's letting individual passages stand or fall on their own merit. And the nature of... Uh of hallucination theories and stuff like that. That's like a whole other line of thinking. If you haven't seen it already, I'd encourage you to watch my brief How Christianity Probably Started Without Resurrection video, which lays out a very simple line of events that would fully explain not only what we see in the Bible, but in all of the history Mike presented today. So I'm not saying they were sincerely indoctrinated. I'm saying they're sincere about seeing Jesus alive after his death. And yet, Mike can't point anywhere to a phrase like, I, Peter, saw Jesus alive, or I, James, saw my brother Jesus alive. If we want to believe that these men saw Jesus alive, we have to take the word of anonymous authors, decades later, and thousands of miles away. We need to grant sweeping generous interpretations and inference, rather than point to clear, unambiguous reporting. It's the difference between caring about whether an idea is merely plausible, or whether an idea is actually testable, true, and affirmed. And that's pretty much it, because we're building an evidential case. And evidential cases do require quite a lot of evidence. And on that, we finally agree. Looking forward to hearing it someday. So I'm going to have like a resurrection playlist on my channel that will have content that might help you if you're having these discussions and debates where people challenge you and you can have sort of a resource to look at. I too have a resurrection playlist linked in the description and in the card above if you want resources to be one of those people challenging people on the resurrection. If you want to support this ministry, um, that's, that's how I'm going to continue doing this to full time and devoting the hours of prep it takes every week to do these things. If you want to support Apologia, I'm doing this stuff in my limited spare time, but it takes as many hours for me as it does for Mike. I have to read the books that he reads and then actually look into the sources, plus read the dissenting books. It's a lot of time and I'd like to dedicate more of mine to it. So if you find my videos valuable, there are links to Patreon and PayPal in the description below. Your generous support is beyond appreciated. And I uh, thank you guys for being here. Have a fantastic day. I'm looking for the button to stop the stream. We did it.